So, good day, everybody, and welcome to the Spotlight Mining podcast uh, in video form today. I'm here with Teo Dechev from Manduro Capital. Teo, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks very much for having us on your show. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Uh, how's Vancouver doing today? Vancouver is quiet. Uh, a lot of people are staying home, bunkering down, similar to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mandura's projects are mostly operational in Serbia at the moment. How is Serbia coping with the COVID outbreak? Any changes to operations there? Yeah, Serbia and Bulgaria are both actually on uh, emergency kind of lockdown. Um, so foreigners are not really able to travel freely across the border. So really, it's um, all of our programs, as you know, when you visited last year, are run by local Serbians, and we also have local Bulgarians. And so that has actually enabled us to continue drilling. Uh, so we're currently drilling on our Jeleznik program, and um, we are waiting for the forestry department to give us permits for the Freeport program. Um, so we're expecting that maybe by April we'll be able to get back to drilling with, um, with Freeport. But certainly we are drilling. We're all very cautious. We're taking a lot of precautions in terms of not coming in contact with people, but we are still operating. Yeah, it's another benefit to having a local team, I suppose. You don't have the, the disruptions at these times that otherwise you might. Exactly. Yes, it definitely ha helps to have a local team and a community there in Bohr where there's local assay labs, local drillers, anything that you need for as an exploration company or quite frankly, even as a mining company, you can get locally in town. Yeah, and it's uh, time for Serbia to show off what it can do without uh, Canadians interfering, I suppose. Ah, absolutely. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what Mandura are doing in the Balkans at the moment. Um, so high level overview, we're focused on the two countries, Serbia and Bulgaria. We haven't really strayed outside of those two jurisdictions. Uh, we're really focused on the upper Cretaceous portion of the Tethian belt. So in Serbia, we're in the Timok region and in Bulgaria, we're in the Panagorishta and the Rodops. So as a company, uh, we have operations in, in really those two jurisdictions. We have a team that goes back and forth between the various pro, uh, projects. And as you know, a big focus for us is the partner model. And as a result, a lot of the work we do, we collaborate with our partners and execute on programs that they uh, have really requested us to do. Yeah. So you mentioned the partner model there. You have quite a lot of major partners involved in your project. What's it been like uh, moving from being a junior player to working on these big scale uh, major projects? Uh, I think it's been pretty good. Um, so a as an exploration company, most companies that go out there and they have their projects, they have their programs, you know, they put all of their procedures in place and they rarely ever have a third party come in and audit that uh, procedure and, and um, really request changes. So as a company that works with very large partners like Jogmec, Freeport and Ballet, what we do is uh, we explain what kind of uh, procedures we go through when we go out on site, how we do our sampling, how we do our logging, uh, how we do our sampling for assays, which assays we go out and collect or um, request from the assay labs. And then, of course, how we interpret and how we enter all of that data into our 3D data sets. So each partner is a little bit different. They have a little bit different requirements of what's important to them to see in a drill log how to see that drill log, how to see that 3D interpretation. Um, so we adjust all of our programs to suit the needs of that specific partner. Yeah. And how do you manage that within the core shed? Um, I mean, do you have big signs up saying today is Jogmec day, today is Freeport day, or the team <laughs> the team just know what they're doing? Or <laughs> we, we have actually, we, that's a fantastic question, uh, because I'm sure it's, it's hard to imagine from the outside. But we actually have um, weekly programs for all of the projects. So the team knows exactly what they're doing every single week. We have uh, weekly calls that discuss who's going to be on what site doing what. So the team has very good uh, runway in terms of what, ne what needs to be accomplished that week. And as you know, our core shed is actually divided physically into separate areas. So each partner has their own core logging facility. They have their own core logging rooms with you know, particular lighting. Everything is sectioned off. It's locked with different keys. So no one can you know, casually <laughs> walk into <laughs> someone else's program. Everything is very strictly controlled. And uh, in terms of software you're using, does all of this go into the same software cloud or do your team have to learn different, different bits of software? Yeah, 
we, we do use different pieces of software for different purposes. Uh, and thank goodness that the software providers are now providing more flexibility with those licenses. And as you know, they're now providing, you know, daily license. Um, so you can go and, uh, you know, use LeapFrog for a day or go use LeapFrog for a week. Uh, we all use MapInfo on a regular basis. That's kind of our, our go-to tool. And then we use uh, the 3D data sets on an as-needed basis. But we have actually, in 2019, converted all of our data into 3D data sets. That was an extremely important part of transitioning these programs as they become uh, really data heavy. And it takes uh, quite a bit, quite a lot of communication between GIS and geologists to work together and make sure that that data set is complete, it's accurate and useful at the end of the day. And that the geologist has to be able to use it. So yes, we do use multiple platforms and yes, we do have to have multiple data rooms. So you're hiding away some very skilled GIS and geologists in Serbia well, <laughs> who can use all of these bits of software. <laughs> Yeah, we've got two of them, actually, two, two guys that are uh, full time dedicated to that. Yeah. So one of your major partners is Valley, who you announced a part, uh, an earning agreement with about five months ago now. Uh, how's that project progressing? I think it's um, doing well in the sense that, you know, when you start these programs, you have to set it up legally and corporately. So we've been in that planning stage um, that should be hopefully completed this year. Obviously, with the coronavirus concerns, um, it you know, changes the level of activity in the ministries. So it, you know, slows down a lot of the process. Uh, but we are hopeful that that's going to get completed. And then at that point, we can go out in the field and start working. But what we've been doing in the meantime is reviewing the data sets. So, you know, how much data is on one specific target versus a regional data set? What are some of the first programs we can implement once we get out in the field? Should we do uh, soil sampling? Do we need to do more geophysics? What kind of geophysics? Where does it need to be done? What kind of permissions need to be attained? So all of that planning is really what we're going through now. Yeah. And uh, with all of these uh, major partnerships, uh, Amanduro considering managing some of these projects on your own? Are you planning to take some, take some on and improve them yourselves or? Well, we always review every single project and look at, you know, what does our shareholder base want from us? Uh, obviously, you know, everyone wants to make a good return on their investment. Uh, but at the same time, how you utilize capital makes a big difference in terms of ultimately how much dilution a shareholder base is going to experience. So we look at every program, we look at our uh, cash resources, we look at the market's ability to fund those programs, and then we weigh that against partner interest and partner um, kind of um, what they would offer for these types of programs. And, you know, every project that we have goes through that screening process. Uh, and so far, the projects have been pretty fantastic for partnerships. Uh, so we've chosen to go down that road. But yes, there is definitely opportunity for us to drill on our own uh, for the right project in the right market conditions. But as you know, the market conditions really right now, I think, are going to struggle with funding uh, exploration. Yeah. And all, along the lines of market conditions, you have quite a lot of experience yourself in investment banking. Um, what do you think of the markets now in a, in a very broad context? Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, without any crystal balls, <laughs> otherwise I'd be trading my stocks. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, well, basically, you know, we fundamentally believe that the long-term picture for copper is very good. We don't believe that uh, the existing mine supply can meet all of the uh, demand for copper. So there will be, I think, a rebalancing of copper prices to reflect that story. When it'll happen, you know, we obviously don't know. We were hoping that it would be better reflected in, in the copper price last year, but certainly with coronavirus right now, it's gonna have an impact on the copper price. And I think that's why these partner programs are so vital and critical, especially when you look at copper expiration. You know, you can have a thousand companies exploring for gold because there's more, uh, what I would call, investor uh, equity market appetite but for the copper companies you know maybe there's 30 that are doing exploration so those programs are are going to be under a lot of pressure and i think that um, you're probably going to see more partnerships in the industry if you haven't already seen that in 2019. Mm. and for mandoro specifically you've got uh, around 2.6 million in the bank now is that right yes exactly yeah so you're fairly secure moving forwards uh, there's no major panic in Kathmandu. No, 
<laughs> exactly, no. there isn't. And you know, we we specifically um, financed at the end of 2019 uh, for about a two year runway. Uh, you know, assuming that our programs are are moving forward as kind of budgeted. Uh, so we budgeted for a two year runway, and I'm hoping that that's not going to change. The only thing that would really make that change is if we had a fantastic opportunity to uh, take advantage of, and then of course it would use up more capital. But those are on an as needed basis, and obviously dependent on the markets. Very good. So Tia, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been really cool to speak. Yes. And. Uh, Wishing you and the team well in, in Vancouver and Serbia. Thank you. And to you too as well in, in um, Slovakia. In Slovakia, in the bunker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cheers to you. Bye. All right.